Hello, I'm Joseph Rochino, talking about my book, Conducting Opera, Where Theater Meets Music. Now, every opera goer recognizes what I just played. It's the opening of Act Two of Puccini's La Boheme. It takes place on Christmas Eve. Now, what you probably didn't realize is that embedded in this opening is a Christmas carol. I'll play it again, and then I will play it much slower and with a different rhythm, and you'll hear what I mean. A Christmas carol called The First Noel. Composers often like to embed quotations and no, many, and no one more than Puccini. In fact, in my book, I discuss Puccini's endless and imaginative tunesmithing at length. In addition to Giacomo Puccini, Richard Strauss also liked to do this. In fact, Mozart, Strauss, and Puccini even quote themselves in later works. But other than this Bohem quote, there aren't very many examples of Christmas carols being put into operas, except for one that I know of. Very mischievously, Charles Gounod, in his opera Faust, puts a famous French Christmas carol into the aria Le Vaudor for the Devil. You know it as Angels we have heard on high. It, in, the, in the French, it's called the Les Anges dans nos campagnes. Okay, this brings us to Christmas and opera. Ballet companies have a Christmas gift that keeps on giving. It is Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker. And virtually every company in North America performs it at Christmas. And it actually makes money. It sells out and sometimes as many as 20 performances. Uh, more and more theater companies are doing a dramatic presentation of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol at Christmas. And it works very well. Symphony orchestras like to do the Messiah of Handel for Christmas. However, I really think Messiah deals much more with the Easter story than with Christmas. So what do opera companies do? Well, there is only really one opera that is a Christmas opera that has entered the standard repertory, but in no way is it as popular as Nutcracker or A Christmas Carol. And that is Giancarlo Menotti's Amal and the Night Visitors. What opera companies tended to do was a family type opera as a matinee where, uh, since it was usually vacation time during the holidays, the family would attend the opera. For years, this opera was Hansel and Gretel. And recently, more and more opera companies are doing Mozart's The Magic Flute in a slightly cut version, so it's closer to two and a half hours than three hours for the family. In both cases, they tend to be done in the language of the audience rather than in the original language, if the audience is not German speaking. Now, this absence of Christmas opera is not for lack of trying. Just in the last 15 years or so, Jake Heggie has written two operas that have a Christmas connection. One is, it's A Wonderful Life, based on the movie of the same title, 
And the other is a work I performed five years ago called Three Decembers. Now, the majority of the opera takes place at Christmas time, but the story itself has virtually nothing to do with Christmas. It's, in, the opera is performed a lot, but not as a Christmas opera. Another work that has a, a, a connection to Christmas is Kevin Putz's Pulitzer winning uh, opera, Silent Night, which is the story of the truce between German and English soldiers during World War I. Uh, there again, uh, it's because it's Christmas, but uh, it's not really a Christmas opera. And the opera is being performed quite a bit, but not for Christmas. It's being performed for, as an opera, for spring or fall or whatever. No, what I would like to propose for both opera companies and symphonies is a work, an oratorio, by Hector Berlioz called L'Enfance du Christ, The Childhood of Christ. I first heard it when I was about 15 or 16. At that time, in New York, there was an orchestra that for a few years performed this piece as a Christmas event. And I thought it was absolutely beautiful. 15 years ago, I got a chance to conduct it myself. It was in the context of a symphony concert for Christmas. And the reason I say both opera companies and symphony orchestras could perform it as a Christmas event is because Berlioz has given some stage direction into the score, which lets me think that he thought of it in a somewhat dramatic fashion. What I did when we presented it as a concert was we had two screens, one rather small, a super title screen, which gave the translation to the audience. We performed it in the original French. And the other much larger screen was happened when there were these orchestral sections. When we had the singing, whether they were soloists or chorus, we just showed the translation. When the orchestra had these intermittent um, sections, sometimes as long as five and six minutes, we projected paintings from early Renaissance through the 19th century that showed events that were happening, the slaughter of the innocents, the nativity, now, when I first looked at the score, the first thing that struck me was the ending. Eight pages of just a cappella chorus. Now, very intelligently, Berlioz never brings the orchestra in at any point in this long a cappella section. So that if there was a little either going flat or going sharp in the pitch on the part of the chorus without any orchestra underneath it, you won't notice it, where you certainly would if it doesn't line up perfectly with the orchestra if they came back in. The other thing I noticed is that most of this a cappella section is marked very soft. In fact, the whole last, set, last part of it, last page, is four Ps. In an earlier video, I said the adage, theater adage, dying is easy, comedy is hard. Well, in music, one could say, fast and loud is easier than slow and soft. It's one of the challenges in doing a piece like this. This is a fairly long piece. It's over an hour and a half long. And it requires, as all kinds of slow, quiet music does, a little extra commitment, a little extra dedication on the part of the musicians to it. If you want a little more love of the work, it doesn't play itself. More attention to slight shifts in accent, in phrasing. And from a stick technique point of the conductor, most of the work is done in very slow beat patterns. For example, m works that are three, four, 
the indication is to beat in one, very slowly. There's some slow sections in 6-8 where you beat in two, very slowly. It, it gives a kind of mystical effect. And subdividing, beating out the individual notes would kill that. I would like to play my favorite part of the oratorio, and it illustrates this. It is the last part of the Farewell of the Shepherds to the Holy Family, followed by, this is for chorus and orchestra, followed by a purely orchestral section called The Rest on the Flight into Egypt. Listen to how beautifully the two pieces are connected and the stillness and almost magic of the mood. Finally, I'd like to talk about a trio that happens in the third part, last part of this oratorio. It's at a touching plot point in the story. The Holy Family has arrived in Egypt and they are rejected first by the Romans, then by the Egyptians, but they are welcomed by an Ishmaelite family. And the father of the Ishmaelite family, proposes an entertainment for the new guests. And this entertainment is a trio. Two harps, I mean, excuse me, two flutes and a harp. Now, when I performed it, I did not leave the flutes in the orchestra and the harp in the orchestra. First of all, the harp does not play in any other part of the oratorio. No, I set up downstage very clear view of the audience, three music stands with the appropriate music on it, three chairs, and the instrument, the harp. At rehearsal 72, enough time was allowed for the harpist to enter and the two flutists to come from the orchestra down to this point. Now, those of you looking at the score will say, oh, but you're leaving out, when, they, when that happens, you're leaving out a line that the flutes have. Yes, but 
that is covered, the same notes are covered by oboe and clarinet. So I thought it was worth it to get this effect. They, this way, they play it as soloists, as a chamber music. I slightly darken the whole stage, except a spotlight on them. And the middle section of the trio is kind of tricky. It's fast, with some kind of strange rhythms. And when the harp is a distance from the two flutes, the conductor has to conduct it, usually, to keep things in sync. And when the three of them are right next to each other, they can just play it. So not only is this interesting for the audience visually, but it is very satisfying to give this kind of recognition to the musicians. I just want to play the end of the trio to give you an idea of what the mood of that trio is. I wish you a safe and a very happy holiday. And by the way, consider giving conducting opera as a gift. <laughs>